السلام علیکم میری بہن ویلکم بیک ٹو دس چینل دس از می آریہ وحید یو آر آن دا چینل آف میڈی کیئر سو ویلکم بیک ٹو دس چیپٹر سو ایز یو ڈسکس ڈیٹ وی آر ڈسکسنگ دا اینٹی ہائپر ٹینسو ڈرگس اینڈ وی ہیو ڈسکس آل دا کلاسیفیکیشن آف اٹ دا لاسٹ کلاسیفیکیشن آف اینٹی ہائپر ٹینسو ڈرگ از دا ڈائیوریٹکس یو نو ویری ویل اباؤٹ دا ہائپر ٹینسو سو دیز آر دا ڈرگس وچ آر یوز ٹو ٹریٹ دا ہائی بلڈ پریشر so uh, diuretics uh, they are not used uh, properly because they cannot be given to a patient who has renal diseases but uh, in some cases we can use them and the diuretics has a broad classification within themselves so what are diuretics and what they are doing let's discuss it so first of all diuretics they are the medication that promotes the diuresis diuresis mean increase in the production of urine so the condition in which your urine production increases this is called as diuretics how diuretics are used to treat the hypertension they not only treat the hypertension but also treat uh, heart failure and edema how because they are releasing more and more water and salt through your urine as you know whenever there is decrease in the volume of blood there is decrease in the blood pressure and as a result you can treat a person who has hypertension so that's why the diuretics are used for that purpose in the heart failure you know because we have to decrease the stress on the heart so the stress on the heart can be decreased out by decreasing the blood volume or by decreasing the blood pressure so that's why we can give diuretics to particular patient next we will discuss the classification of diuretics it has been divided into the five groups the first group is carbonic acid uh, and hydrates inhibitor loop diuretics thiazide diuretics potassium sparing diuretics and osmotic diuretics so a lot of classification within itself but we will discuss only the first classification in it the first uh, classification is the carbonic and hydrate inhibitors so the first classification is carbonic hydrate inhibitors they are also called as cai okay so they are the inhibitor of carbonic and hydrate so what are the drugs included in it so it consists of three drugs ایسیٹا زولا امائڈ سو زولا امائڈ ڈیریٹس فیملی اینڈ ایسیٹا ڈورا اینڈ ڈور اور سوری برنگ دیز آر دا فرسٹ ورڈس وچ یو ہیو ٹو ایڈ ام بون اٹ سو وٹ از دا ٹرک ٹو ریمبر دین ایسیٹا ڈور برنگ یعنی آپ کوئی بندی ہے ایسیٹا آپ اسے کہہ رہے ہیں کہ ڈور خرید کے لاؤ سو ایسیٹا پلیز ڈور برنگ so what is the acetazolamide it is a pro type of drug very commonly used and it has very good type of effect so therefore it is most commonly used but it also has some adverse effect in them and uh, the second two drugs dora zolamide and bring zolamide they are used in the form of eye drops they are instilled into the eye because it it has relation with the eye it is used in in that part also so but the patient who have anti uh, hypertension we give this drug to them okay so what is the mechanism so it is acting on the pct what is pct is the it is a proximal convoluting tubule so one thing you have to remember i have uh, read, write them in a uh, order like the first drug is acting on pct proximal convoluting tubule second is acting on the loop of henle third is acting on the ascending thick ascending loop of henle fourth is acting on the early uh, distal convoluting tubule and the last osmotic diuretics they are acting on the last part of diuretic uh, sorry distal convoluted tubule which is the late distal convoluted tubule so i have write them in the order so the first we have discussed so it acting on the first part of your nephron which is this pct so here i have drawn a nephron for you this is the uh, glomerulus capillary or your bowman's capsule then this part is called as proxima convoluting tubule and within this part i have drawn a lot of capillaries here so in the loop of henle these capillaries are called as vasa recta and here these capillaries are given because they are getting all the minerals or water which is reabsorbed so all the reabsorbed material get into these capillaries and move into your blood 
So what is the mechanism? How they are decreasing your blood pressure? They are not directly decreasing the sodium reabsorption. As you know, whenever there is increase in the sodium reabsorption, there is increase in the blood volume. As a result, blood pressure increases. But they don't directly uh, decrease or increase the sodium reabsorption. They have other mechanisms by which it is decreasing the sodium reabsorption. As a result, it is decreasing the blood pressure. And next important point, it cannot be given in the first line of therapy. The one of the major reason is that uh, due to a complex mechanism of it, therefore it can cause a lot of complication. And the second reason of uh, uh, due to which we not give them as a first line of therapy because they have very short duration. So a patient who have to take this drug for his lifetime, so we cannot prefer the carbonic anhydride inhibitors to these patients because they don't have enough time to take their drug again and again and again. So therefore, we will give them a drug which have a long duration. But carbonic anhydrase, unfortunately, it doesn't have a long duration. Therefore, we cannot give it in as a first line of therapy. So what is doing it? This drug is acting on that part. What is normally occurring in your PCT, in your proximal convoluted tubule, you know very well this is a part in which 65% of your sodium is reabsorbed back. Because sodium is one of the most important electrolyte which is present in your body and it is controlling a lot of functions. And you know one of the most important and the most abundant pump which is the present in your body is the sodium potassium pump which is regulating the concentration of sodium inside your body and outside. So uh, maximum 65% of sodium is reabsorbed here, while the other 25% is reabsorbed through this ascending loop of NLA and uh, while other 5% is absorbed by this distal convoluting tubule. But these ratios are not 100% uh, correct because whenever you take the water more, these percentages changes. And whenever you take the salt intake more, these percentage changes. But the total uh, sodium reabsorption um, percentage is the 100%. 65 plus 25 plus 5 plus 5. It will add up, it will total become equal to 100 so the maximum sodium reabsorption is occurring through that part and followed by the water reabsorption as you know whenever there is a reabsorption of sodium the water moves because of the osmosis process as we know whenever there is an increase in the solute concentration in a particular area the water moves toward it to compensate at that concentration so now discuss uh, the whole mechanism that how it is acting on PCT and how it is controlling the sodium reabsorption and water reabsorption. So let's discuss it with the diagram. So here I have drawn a diagram for you that is very uh, uh, easy to see. As you can see, this is a cell I have drawn. This is a cell of PCT. PCT is your proximal convoluting tubule. I have cut it a cell from it and place it in front of you. Now what I am doing uh, besides the PCT, I have drawn the two tubes like structure. What it is, the first, this tube is called the lumen. So why it is the lumen? Because you know that our this like consider it as a proximal convoluting tubule. With this proximal convoluting tubule, this membrane is the cell. So I have picked up this cell and brought it to here. And inside this tube, there is a lumen. So all of this shaded part I am drawing to you. This is the lumen. So I have drawn the lumen here. And I have extended the membrane of it. Okay. And with this capillary, the, uh, with this tube, a capillary is rounded like that. So this capillary is shown by this tube, okay? So this is your capillary, this is your lumen, this is your cell. Now there is uh, these, all of the membranes of this lumen, this cell and this capillary, they are connected with what? With a pump. Various kind of pumps are present here, like this is a pump here. This is also present and this is also present. They have different functions. So they are connecting each other. First of all, through your this lumen, okay, through this lumen, you know all the filtrate from the Bowman's capsule 
came into PCT. Okay, so this filter it contain a lot of things. It contain the waste material. It contain the sodium. It contain potassium. It contain water. It contain bicarbonate. All of the ions, all of the minerals are present in it. Now we have to absorb it. Now first I will explain the normal physiology. Then I will explain the pathophysiology and how the drug is acting on it. So the first, as you can see, the sodium came into the lumen. This uh, sodium will reabsorb by a potassium uh, by a pump which is present here. This pump is called sodium proton pump. So due to the exchange of uh, sodium here, a hydrogen, a proton moves here into the lumen. So this hydrogen will excrete it out. But not only this hydrogen is excreted out, actually this hydrogen will make a bond with the bicarbonate present in the lumen. So as I have said that the bicarbonate is also present in that lumen. So when the hydrogen came, it from the bond. So it will make an acid which is called as carbonic acid, H2CO3. It is a carbonic acid. Now you know carbonic acid is not stable, it dissociates into what into two parts the first part is your carbon dioxide and second is water now your carbon dioxide can diffuse easily through your membrane it doesn't need any kind of proton pump yes it need an enzyme for the diffusion and this enzyme is called as carbonic anhydrase enzyme so it helping in the carbon dioxide to move in this cell okay so after uh, moving into the cell, the water which is already present in that cell, they will combine. Water plus carbon dioxide, they, are, they combine to give again the acid which is called as carbonic uh, acid. Now carbonic acid is again dissociated with the help of uh, enzyme which is called as carbonic and hydrase enzyme into the hydrogen and into bicarbonate. Now this hydrogen is again taken up by this proton pump called as potassium sodium hydrogen yeah, proton pump now as you can see here the sodium uh, which is re reabsorbed here this is the 65 percent of your sodium now this 65 percent of sodium goes to what part this sodium goes to this channel which is present here it will reabsorb uh, and the potassium will move to here so this is this proton pump is called as sodium potassium ATPase pump. So due to the movement of sodium here, the water also moves to capillary. So uh, sodium and water concentration inside the capillary increases out. As a result, the blood volume increases and the blood pressure increased out. And similarly, the potassium will move into the cell. So as a result of hypokalemia can happen because more and more potassiums move into this uh, lumen and excreted out through your body second uh, this uh, bicarbonate ion which forms through this it will move to this capillary as exchange of chloride so this channel is called as bicarbonate chloride channel so through this channel the bicarbonate is also move inside your body causing change in the pH and causing metabolic acidosis. So metabolic acidosis uh, is a condition in which the pH of your body decreases out. So that's why this is the normal physiology which is occurring inside your body. Now uh, the blood pressure increase in this patient and this patient is become the patient of hypertension. Now we will give uh, the drug to him Suppose we have given uh, this patient the drug of diuretics and we have given him the first class of the drug which is the carbonic anhydrase enzyme. Now what this drug is doing to here. So as you can see here an enzyme is present which name is as carbonic anhydrase enzyme. So this inhibitor, this drug will go and inhibit this enzyme. So it will block the function of this enzyme. Now as you know the function of this enzyme this enzyme is responsible for the carbon dioxide diffusion now carbon dioxide cannot diffuse this enzyme function is to break down the carbolic acid now it cannot do that as a result sodium cannot make an influx due to unavailability of hydrogen the bicarbonate cannot move here the sodium cannot move here as a result 
uh, there will be decrease in the reabsorption of sodium and water there is re decrease in the reabsorption of bicarbonate as a result blood volume decreases out and the blood pressure decreases so that's how this drug is going to act inside your body so now let's discuss that what is the therapeutic use of it we have discussed that it used in the heart failure it used uh, to treat the hypertension but it this drug has a lot of other uses so let's see what it has other beneficial effects so first effect is uh, very sim simple Achha, we have two types of carbonic anhydrases enzyme first is membrane bounded and second is cytoplasmic so this enzyme as you can see here this is a membrane bounded enzyme and this enzyme is present in the cytoplasm so it doesn't mean it is membrane bounded or it is cytoplasmic your carbonic anhydrase drug will block both of these type of these enzyme so let's discuss their therapeutic use so they are used in the heart failure to decrease the stress of the heart to decrease the blood pressure and all of that they are used to treat the hypertension by decreasing sodium or water reabsorption decreasing the blood pressure and the next disease in which they are used is the motion sickness in the motion sickness you know whenever our eyes are seeing something else and our vestibular apparatus is seeing something else so as a result there is uh, increase in the vestibular sensitivity as a result your vestibular apparatus it has two receptors on it histamine receptor and mesclinic receptor these two receptor after the binding with the histamine or acetylcholine they will send messages to your brain uh, to your ctz area to your chemo trigger zone as a result they increase the signals toward the vomiting center and the vomiting center it again uh, a very important part of your brain it increased the vomiting sensation by increasing the pressure on your abdominal muscle by increasing the contraction of diaphragm so it is putting the pressure on your abdomen as a result the GIT content will move out through your mouth and the vomiting occurs so uh, we use this drug in the motion sickness but, uh, it, because it decreases the sensitivity of vestibular apparatus so it will block the signals which is sent by vestibular apparatus to your uh, brain to your ctz area to your vomiting center as a result vomiting cannot occur second disease which, which is used to treat is the attitude sickness attitude sickness is just similar to the motion sickness how attitude mean to go on the high altitude high altitude mean if you go to the mountain side so whenever you go there uh, you will feel that there is decrease in the supply of oxygen whenever there is decrease in the supply of oxygen the patient cannot breathe properly so as a result the altitude sickness will happen to him so what is going to here as he goes to the mountain side or increase in the altitude the vomiting can occur because the patient cannot breathe properly he got very low oxygen supply now if he goes if he is facing all of these symptoms we will give carbonic anhydrase inhibitor to that patient now what this drug is doing inside that he this drug decreases the bicarbonate reabsorption as we have seen here here now after uh, blocking this enzyme now bicarbonate cannot diffuse it as a result there is decrease in this uh, reabsorption and as a result now uh, there is decrease in the ph which causes the metabolic acidosis and as a result this metabolic acidosis um, will sense by our chemo receptors this send signals to your lungs so now you think that what is the relation between them because we have to increase the oxygen supply therefore we are sending signals to the lungs that to increase the respiration so lungs will increase the respiratory rate it will increase the inspiration it will increase the expiration process as a result the patient will take increase the uh, breath deep now the patient take the uh, breath deeply like if i am uh, doing that so this is a deep breath 
so i have taken a deep breath so as a result there will be increase in the oxygen supply increase in the tidal volume so the hyperventilation occur because oxygen supply is more and more more and more uh, respiratory rate is occurring so now as a result the carbon dioxide exhalation is also increased uh, if we increase the inhalation we also increase the exhalation we have increased a lot of carbon dioxide outside so more and more carbon dioxide released through your body as a result the carbon dioxide which is present here at that part it decreases out and it also used to treat the metabolic acidosis as a result metabolic acidosis is also treated out now it also used in other like fluid diuresis if a patient who have a lot of water in his body we have to decrease the water so we will give fluid diuresis like the patient who have the edema so in edema what is going to happen uh, a lot of fluid is uh, stored in various body part in the peripheral body parts in the lungs a lot of fluid is stored we have to uh, release that fluid so we will increase the water excretion by increasing the sodium excretion as as well we get get these results next it also used to treat intraocular pressure that's very important the patient who have high intraocular pressure these patient are called as or this disease is called as glaucoma in the glaucoma patient due to increase in the aqueous humor this is a type of fluid which is released by your ciliary bodies present inside your eye so due to which intraocular pressure is high so means a fluid which is present in your eye and its pressure is increased so you know a fluid is produced in our eye if its pressure increase out then the patient occur and face the glaucoma disease now we will give this drug to the patient of glaucoma how this drug is doing here so actually it inhibit the carbonic anhydrase enzyme present in the eye so not only carbonic anhydrase enzyme is not only present inside your nephron it also present in your eyes so and causing the production of aqueous humor and as a result increase the pressure intraocular pressure but if we give this drug which going to inhibit the carbonic anhydrase enzyme as a result bicarbonate reabsorption decrease aqueous humor will decrease and as a result the pressure will also decrease out so that's how we treat the patient of glaucoma through this drug now let's discuss the next type of disease which treat by that drug so next we will also uh, use that drug to de decrease or to reduce the intracranial pressure intra mean inside cranial mean our cranium our brain okay and pressure mean the pressure inside our brain so what do you think what fluid can increase the pressure inside your brain yes you are right csf cerebral spinal fluid it is a fluid which is present in your brain uh, help to protect your brain okay from a lot of injuries it is protecting it and also decrease the friction here so also pr protecting all the layers of your brain which are protecting we have discussed the meninges here so this fluid is produced by an enzyme which is called as carbonic anhydrase enzyme this enzyme is actually producing this c as a cerebrospinal fluid whenever there is increase in the production of c as a there is increase in uh, this intra intracranial pressure so now we have to decrease it how we decrease it by giving carbonic anhydrase inhibitors by giving this drug so what it is going to do in them it will decrease or it will inhibit carbonic anhydrase enzyme as a result there is decrease in the production of csf and there is decrease in the intracranial pressure so the next we will discuss the pharmacokinetics of that drug as i have explained we give them orally the first drug which is the acetazolamide it is given orally and its absorption is very good but the other two drugs which is dor zolamide zolamide and brink brink 
zolamide. These two drugs are topical apply on your eye. As I have explained that we give this drug to the patient who have intraocular pressure. So we, give, we will not give them the orally drug. We will give them as an eye drop. And the eye drops of two drugs are given door zolamide and brain zolamide we will give them in these patient these uh, eye drops they will put in your eye and as a result the glycoma will treat out their intraocular pressure will decrease next pharmacokinetics is it has very short duration therefore we cannot give them as a first line of therapy i have already explained that point the next is the adverse effect you know every drug has an adverse effect to so these uh carbonic anhydrase inhibitors they also has adverse effect that they can cause metabolic acidosis decrease the ph of your body they can cause hypokalemia because decreasing the reabsorption of sodium they also decrease the potassium reabsorption by inhibiting the pump as a result uh, the potassium is more and more excreted out through your body if the potassium moves out to your body then there is a hypokalemia in it, inside your body so the potassium concentration inside your body will decrease so as a result you will face the hypokalemia situation next they can cause urinary alkalization urinary alkaline urinary mean your urine alkalination mean increase in the ph of urine so they are decreasing the ph of your body no doubt they are doing that but increase the ph of urine why because metabolic acidosis occur because of decrease in hco3 negative bicarbonate ion but now inside your urine there is increase in hco3 because if the body has this low concentration it means it is secreted out through your body so it means the urine through uh, through urine the bicarbonate ion is released inside the urine the bicarbonate concentration is increased so whenever there is increase in the bicarbonate ion concentration there is increase in the ph as a result urinary alkylation will happen so due to which sometimes the calcium precipitation can occur so calcium is a um, <clears throat> ion which is present in your body it can precipitate out inside your nephrons inside your kidney as a result due to its precipitation the renal stone can form so this is the adverse effect of this drug the next adverse effect is the ammonium toxicity <coughs> as you know through your lumen uh, along with the uh, sodium along with the water along with the bicarbonate along with the hydrogen proton uh, your um, ammonia is also released through it so your ammonia can absorb through your lumen because when the hydrogen act with this ammonia it will form nh4 positive which is a polar it has charge on it now it cannot be absorbed so now if it cannot be absorbed it excreted out because now it is cannot be absorbed so ammonium cannot be absorbed is our beneficial it cannot be absorbed as a result it excreted out but due to the, by giving this drug this ammonia increase in the blood because now it cannot combine with the hydrogen it cannot form a charge due to which this uncharged ammonia it can absorb it can be absorbed as a result it doesn't excrete it out it will move inside your uh, blood and cause the brain damage because ammonia is a very dangerous uh, chemical for your brain and for your other body parts next adverse effect they can cause git disturbance like nausea vomiting and diarrhea uh, etc the next two these adverse effect are caused by a drug which is called a acetazolamide which is given orally the first adverse is paresthesia paresthesia is a abnormal sensation in which the patient feel the pricking of pins and needles inside any where part of your body like the patient mostly feels like the pins and needles are pricking to him at the at the arms and mostly at the legs part so this uh, sensation or this particular adverse effect can occur due to these drugs 
because they damage the nerves of your body so uh, as a result the patient will feel this sensations the next they can cause taste adul adulteration mean the taste will change out the patient cannot enjoy the food taste okay so next uh, we will discuss the contraindication of this drug that we uh, what kind of patient that in which we cannot give particular these drugs to that patient so let's see it so the first contraindication that we cannot give this drug to a patient who has severe renal disorders because you know carbonic anhydrase they have uh, uh, mainly work in uh, in your inside your nephrons and nephrons is inside your renal inside your kidney so the patient who have already kidney disorder we cannot give them to uh, this drug to that patient and we cannot give the patient who have already hypersensitivity to that kind of drug uh, we cannot give these drugs to a patient who have liver disorder who have copd is mean chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases because it also has a uh, function on the lungs when we have discussed the altitude sickness so we have discussed this and sickness to your lungs as a result increase in the ventilation so uh, the patient who have already compromised lung we cannot give them these drug to them because it can cause severe complications for them next thing is we cannot give this drug to a patient who have already electrolyte imbalance like a patient who have already hypokalemia if we give this drug to him a severe kind of hypokalemia will occur to him and you know kalemia mean uh, potassium is one of the most important electrolyte which is very beneficial for your heart functioning so if the potassium concentration is decrease out it will cannot uh, now your heart cannot functions uh, properly so next uh, this is a very important question for the viva point of view and this question is why we give beta blockers so sorry for it so the question is why we give beta blockers and diuretics in combination with direct vasodilator so uh, you know direct vasodilators are the uh, another class of drug which is given to a patient who have hypertension so what is happening actually after giving the di direct vasodilators inside your body a complementary system start which as a result increase your blood pressure so this is a opposite comp uh, compensatory mechanism so how it is working let's see it so if you give the vasodilator drug to your patient it will cause vasodilation as a result blood pressure will decrease but now other kind of complementary system start like this is a again complementary system this is a complementary system and this is a whole complementary system and as a result they are increasing the blood pressure but how they are doing that let's see on it the so first mechanism we are discussing this how this pathway adopt so you know your blood pressure decrease now this decrease blood flow go to your kidney so your kidney will receive low blood flow and you know about uh, the kidney is the second most abundant organ present inside your body who gave second uh, abundant blood flow so like uh, the liver is the first organ who get maximum percent of blood and after the liver the kidney is the second most abundant organ which get maximum blood flow now decrease blood flow goes to the renal as a result there is decrease in the sodium excretion sodium uh, will not move outside your body it's mean sodium retention increases mean more and more sodium uh, in present inside your body as a result blood volume increase and the blood pressure increases out now let this is the second complementary system which is like that so blood pressure decrease and you know inside your kidney the jg cells are present which in response to the less blood pressure release the renin renin is the one of the most important chemical which after the release stimulate the renin angiotensin system renin angiotensin 2 is produced after some uh, some steps i am not repeating that so renin angiotensin 2 is a important vasoconstrictor or, uh, which is present in your body so after the vasoconstriction is caused increase in the blood pressure not only it causes the vasoconstriction also it stimulate the adrenal gland to release aldosterone 
Aldosterone increase the sodium reabsorption. Now, if the sodium reabsorption increase, you know, whenever there is increase in the sodium and water reabsorption, blood volume increase, and as a result, increase in the blood pressure. So you can say it, it again go back to it because now the blood flow decrease and all of these things are present. So you can move this to that part. Okay. So next complementary system is this part. So let's discuss it. So whenever your blood pressure is low, the baroreceptors are the specific kind of receptor which are present inside your body. So what is the function of the baroreceptors? So these are the receptors which sense uh, the decrease or in increase in the blood pressure. So now they are sensing the decrease in the blood pressure. They will send signals to your sympathetic nervous system. As a result, the sympathetic nervous system, it increases its activity. And now what is the function of sympathetic nervous system? It will go send signals to increase the renin secretion. As a result, whole this cascade will occur. They will also uh, cause the vasoconstriction of blood vessels and increase the blood pressure. They will also send signals to your heart to increase the heart rate. As a result, cardiac output increase and due to cardiac output, your blood pressure will increase. They will also send signals to your heart to increase the contraction. As a result, cardiac output increase. Due to cardiac output, the blood pressure will increase out. So that's why this is a, a complementary system present inside your body, which playing important role to regulate how, uh, whether you are giving a vasodilator, your blood pressure is increased and how it is doing that. So now we will discuss how the beta blockers, the diuretics, what they are doing in that process. So actually I have drawn here, a uh, dark shaded part in these so on this dark shaded part i have written the dd so here i am giving the uh, diuretics to that patient so blood pressure decrease uh, with the combination of vasodilator i have given the diuretics due to the diuretics it will block these signals to your renal as a result there is decrease in the sodium reabsorption we have discussed that how the diuretics is acting when, um, through your uh, sodium reabsorption and also it decreased this part as it is decreasing the sodium reabsorption how it is doing that we have discussed the function of diuretics in that lecture so if you don't uh, understand this concept uh, move video back and again listen to that lecture so the next is we have also given the beta blockers. So what are the function of beta blocker? Very simple. The beta blockers are acting on that part in on which I have written the BBB. So this is beta blocker. So I am giving the beta blocker along with the vasodilator. So beta blocker will go and doesn't allow to send signals or to increase the renin secretion. If the renin is not released, the whole this cascade will not happen and also beta blockers act on the heart beta 1 blockers block the heart rate as a result cardiac output will not increase the blood pressure will not increase out if i am giving beta blockers they also act on the heart decrease the heart contraction by blocking the uh, receptors present on the heart contractile cells as a result heart contraction decreases out cardiac output decrease and the blood pressure will decrease out so that's why we cannot give the vasodilator to particular patient alone. We cannot give only a single vasodilator to a drug to a patient who is hypertensive. We should have to give him the diuretics. We should have to give him the beta blocker. Because if we don't give him the beta blocker, whole this cascade will occur and as a result his blood pressure will increase out. So therefore, the uh, fu important function of diuretics are given here. They will decrease all this cascade. The beta blockers will decrease all this cascade and protect you from increasing the reflex increase in the blood pressure. So this was all about the today's lecture. I hope that you will enjoy this lecture. If you like it, then please subscribe to my channel, like my videos. And if you have some confusion still left, then definitely you can leave a comment for me. You will can write up the question in the comment box and I will check it and give answer to you. 
थैंक यू सो मच मीट यू सोन इन द नेक्स्ट लेक्चर टेल आप अल्लाह हाफिज़